GSE SS8H10.C describe the relationship between the end of the white primary and the 1946 governor's race. So let's first talk about the end of the white primary. Remember, we talked about this before, part of the disenfranchisement movement of not allowing African-American men to have the ability to vote in the first elections of an election process. So now that process is about to end. The Supreme Court basically said, nah, you can't do that. Sorry, that is unconstitutional. But is basically saying, hey, Georgia and all the other southern states that were using the white primary as a way to disenfranchise African-American males from voting, you need to stop. Because here's why. A guy named Dr. Thomas Brewer and Primus E. King who both were a barber and a minister, attempted to vote in the white primary. They knew what they were doing. King was told that he couldn't vote and he was forcefully removed. He thought, no, I am allowed to vote. The Constitution says so. And he basically said, we're going to sue the state of Georgia, which is why we have the court case King versus Chapman et al., Federal District Court ruled basically in the favor of King and said, yeah, no, you're right. You do have the right to vote. They can't do that. That is unconstitutional. So the end of the white primary was because of a guy, two guys, African-Americans, that wanted to vote. They were told, no, you can't vote. Forcefully removed from the voting area. And then they sued the state of Georgia in 1945. So here's Reverend Primus King challenged the white primary again they the, the supreme court said nah it's unconstitutional and georgia gave him 324 dollars and 70 cents the 70 cents that's important for denying his right to vote uh, dr brewer he worked for the naacp however he was shot to death in a department store in 1956 and his murderer was never charged don't know why, but they were never able to figure out who pulled the trigger on Dr. Thomas Brewer. So the end of the primary, who is the governor right now? Well, if you remember back to the three governors controversy, uh, we have the, I guess you don't remember back to the three, because we're headed that way right now, right? So we don't know about the three governors controversy, but Governor Ellis Arnold, he didn't fight the ruling. He's like, nah. We're going to end the white primary right now and call it a day. It's been ruled upon. The Supreme Court said so. So we're going to follow the rules this time. So here's Governor Ellis Arnold. He basically angered a lot of white people that were like, uh, no, the white primary is a thing. We should be continuing to do this. But he said, nope, we are not going to do it anymore. Which brings us to Eugene Tolmich. So Ellis Arnold was governor at the time. Eugene Talmadge, he was a past governor of Georgia. He said, hey, listen, if Georgia people, if you promise to reinstate me as governor, vote me in, I promise to reinstate or approve of the white primary. Basically, if you elect me, I will make sure we have the white primary back. So in a fourth term as running for governor, he was reelected in 1946. This is eventually going to lead us into the governor's controversy. But before we get there, this is Governor Talmadge, Eugene Talmadge. And he leads us into him himself. Like he is the reason why we have this huge controversy because something happened to him in the 1946 race to be governor. Right now, it's called the 1946 governor's race, but other people may know it as the three governors controversy because in 1946 we had three people that said no i should be governor no i should be governor no i should be governor it made georgia look like a joke to the rest of the united states because we didn't know who was actually going to be our governor <coughs> so here's what happens eugene talmage he gets reelected for his fourth term of governor so be between the time of being elected governor and actually becoming governor, he was like governor-elect, like president-elect. When the president is elected, they don't become president right away. They have to wait a little bit, and eventually over time, then they take their oath of office, and then they become president. 
Just like that, Eugene Talmadge was elected governor, but died before he was able to officially take the oath of office again for the fourth time to become the governor. He had really bad health, and that's why he died. So this caused three other people to say, nah, I should be the governor because he died. I should be the governor. Forget about election results. I should be the governor. Let's get into it. So Talmadge supporters believed, and here's why it's a problem. Talmadge supporters, Eugene's supporters believed he might actually die before he gets elected because that's how much of bad health he had. So they dug up an outdated Georgia law that stated the Georgia General Assembly could select the second or third leading vote getter to become the governor of our state. Not the people of Georgia. Like, hey, if you, if you are the second person, hey, you could be the next governor or the third person. The Georgia General Assembly is going to get to choose it. So there's no re-election. The Georgia General Assembly is going to choose it. So here's what they did. They got Eugene Talmadge's supporters said, hey, if you all write for Herman Talmadge, his son, to become governor like a write-in vote, then he could actually get enough votes to be considered in the second or possibly third person to become governor of our state. So the Georgia Constitution stated that the lieutenant governor first would take office if the governor died. But that's where language art matters. The governor did not die. The governor-elect died. Eugene Talmadge was not officially governor when he died. So the Georgia Constitution stated something that didn't happen in this situation, which made it a problem. So who is Herman Talmadge? He's the son of Eugene, the guy that died, the four-time elected governor of Georgia, three-time official governor of Georgia. His name was written in because his father's failing health. And basically the reason why they wanted to do that was because Herman Talmadge was just a younger, healthier version of Eugene Talmadge. They shared the same views. They shared the same ideas of how to run the state of Georgia. And he basically helped convince Herman Talmadge, convince the Georgia General Assembly to name him governor of the state. He convinced the local lawmakers to give him the job of governor. Here's a video of him. We're totally not watching that right now, but go back to exceedthestandard.com for more videos and Georgia information. There's other people involved. Herman Talmadge is one. Melvin Thompson is another. He was actually elected lieutenant governor in 1946, which means he was second in command. He didn't die. So if the elected governor dies, the second in command should take over. Does that mean the second elect in command should take over? Again, the Georgia Constitution didn't think of this situation ever happening, so they didn't have it written down. But Melvin Thompson claimed he should be the governor after Thomas died because he was second in command, or he would be if he were to actually take office. He was a strong opponent of Eugene Talmadge, and the people really didn't want Melvin Thompson as governor because he was kind of like the opposite of Eugene and Herman Talmadge. So who is Melvin Thompson? He was elected Georgia's first lieutenant governor in 1946, and he felt the Georgia Constitution stated he was the new governor. That's really about it, sort of. Here's Melvin Thompson in the middle. Herman Talmadge on the right during the three governors controversy. This is a real photo. So what happens? In January of 1947, again, the title is 1946 governor's race. So a few months later, the Georgia General Assembly selected Herman Talmadge as governor. They voted him in through the government, the government officials, the legislators, the General Assembly voted him in as governor, not the people of Georgia. The outgoing governor, the person who was actually governor during this time, Ellis Arnold, he's the third guy, said, nah, I'm not leaving. This is all messed up. <laughs> he refused to like give up his keys to the office. He's not going anywhere. He demanded this issue be resolved legally. He didn't believe the General Assembly had the authority to elect a governor without the people's voting on it. He had some problems with this whole issue, as a lot of people probably did. 
The problem is there was no real correct answer. We had to do, or at least the Georgia government in 1946 had to do the best that they could do at that time, which really wasn't that good because it was a mess. But here's Ellis Arnold. He refuses to leave office until a governor was selected. And something actually happens because of this that we're going to get to in a second. Let's see, here it is. Many of Arnold's supporters were involved in fistfights with Herman Talmadge's men. So let's get this like cleared up. Ellis Arnold and Herman Talmadge, Ellis Arnold was the mayor, sorry, governor of Georgia. Herman Talmadge was just appointed the governor job by the General Assembly. The supporters for both of those guys got into fistfights in the government building. Talmadge then said, okay, this is enough. Herman Talmadge had state troopers escort the past governor, Ellis Arnold, out of the Capitol building and then changed the locks on the governor's office doors. He changed the locks on the doors and had the guy, the old governor, escorted out of the Capitol building. Arnold then refused to give up the governor's seal. And the seal is basically a coin that you use to make documents official, specifically for the governor. He's like, nah, you might be the governor, but I'm not giving you the governor's seal. And he said, I'm going to set up my own governor's office since you kicked me out of my other office in the lobby of the Capitol building. So we have huge chaos going on. Who's the real governor? Well, Arnold says he's the governor. Well, Herman Talmadge, the, gov the government said he's now the governor. So finally, Ellis Arnold said, okay, I'm done. Finally gave up his claim to the governorship because he knew he wasn't going to be governor anymore. And then he said, I support Melvin Thompson, the guy who was supposed to be second in command, mostly because Melvin Thompson was the opposite of Eugene Talmadge and Herman Talmadge. So that's kind of why he voted for like, hey, let's just put Thompson in there. So we're not done yet. The Georgia Supreme Court then ruled that Thompson was the rightful governor. I'm confused. The Georgia government said, nah, Herman Talmadge is the governor. We want him to be. But the Georgia Supreme Court basically said, yeah, we know the governor didn't die, but the governor-elect did. So the second in command would normally take over in that situation. So that would be Melvin Thompson. So the Georgia, it went all the way to the Georgia Supreme Court and they said, yeah, Melvin Thompson, you're the rightful governor. Uh, congratulations on your win. Herman Talmadge, to his credit, left the governor's office within two hours of the Georgia Supreme Court ruling, gave the newly changed door locked keys to Melvin Thompson and said, here you go. Two years later, a special election was called. Obviously, we need to solve this problem, so they held another election. Herman Talmadge was officially on the ballot now. We didn't need to write in his name. He was def or he defeated Melvin Thompson in the special election for governor because the people of Georgia wanted Eugene Talmadge. They settled for the second best thing, and that is the opposite of Melvin Thompson. They wanted Herman Talmadge because he also promised to bring back the white primary. This is him talking about it. We're going to skip over this. Question, what did the end of the white primary mean? When painting, one could now use any color as a nope. Only black people could vote in the primary elections now. Nope. Only white people could vote in the real elections. Nope. All people could vote in the primary elections. Yes, all people in all elections, not just primary, but all elections, all people can vote. If there's an election, you can vote if you qualify to be able to vote in that area. You have to live in the same area. What did the 1946 governor's race have to do with the white primary? Again, nothing. No. One more candidate just ran on a platform saying he or they would bring it back, the white primary. Yeah. All candidates were against it. No. All candidates were for it. No. So one or more candidates, yes, yeah, said, if you elect me governor, Eugene Talmadge, I will bring back the white primary. Here's actual footage of the governor's race of 1946. Hey, you won. Again, real video of it. It's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, this is what you need to know. 
You need to know the word relationship. What does it mean between the governors and the white primary? What is the end of the white primary and the 1946 governor's race is also known as the three governors controversy. That's the end of this element. That's the end of this standard. Thank you for watching. I dare you right now to put your finger in your ear and scratch. Go up and down. Start a little slow and go a little faster. It's going to sound like Pac-Man. Peace out. Let me see if I can turn this off.